Hey guys, it's Brie. So you may have been aware I am currently doing a series where we look at political science and science fiction and where the two intersect. Specifically, my training and my education has all been political philosophy and political science. So this for me is always a bright spot in any kind of science fiction work. I love that science fiction really embraces a lot of times its ability to look at political science and, and politics in general and really engage with some of the deeper concepts within it. For me, that is where a lot of the fun comes into play. And so we're gonna start off this series talking about the moon is a harsh mistress. You can see I've tabbed, my sides are filled with notes. We are good to go. Feel free to look in the comments section uh, down below in order to see the timestamps for specific parts of the video. Thanks. But before we get into this, I want to talk for just a quick second about who Robert Heinlein was. Robert Heinlein is a fundamental science fiction figure. He is often cited in the canon and has won basically every retro Hugo he's ever been nominated for. He is really a touchstone for a lot of people who were the generation or two generations before me. For reference, I'm 26. Heinlein was born in 1907 and was an aeronautical engineer for the Navy in World War I. When he came back, and even before that, he had begun writing science fiction and fantasy works and really started engaging with fandom broadly. He's known for so many of his works, but I would say the three major ones that he's known for are Stranger in a Strange Land, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, and Time Enough for Love. Fun fact, I have a Time Enough for Love tattoo. We can talk about that some other day. So today we're going to be talking about The Moon as a Harsh Mistress. This is a touchstone for a lot of libertarian thinkers, especially modern libertarian thinkers who would have grown up with the work. You may even have heard references to The Moon as a Harsh Mistress without ever really knowing it. For instance, in high school I was taught about Tinstoffel, or there is no such thing as a free lunch, and that was a big part of our discussion about capitalism in my AP Econ class. Little did I know at the time that that was a reference to The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Robert Heinlein himself is a really interesting figure in that he embraces a lot of different philosophical ideologies. And while he kind of ends his life on a very right-wing note, he has a lot of leftist influences, and you see that specifically in Time Enough for Love, one of his almost contemporaneous novels. His contemporaneous writers include Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke, and surprisingly Ayn Rand, who makes a couple of appearances within the novel itself. Heinlein has infiltrated the common vernacular through phrases like Tinstoffel, which I've previously mentioned, Grok, which means to understand, and Moonbat. In fact, he's quite frequently referenced without people ever actually knowing that they're referencing Heinlein. And the people who love his work continue on in a legacy of education, specifically through the Heinlein Society, which you can see at any world con or basically any science fiction con ever. But before we delve deep into libertarianism within the book itself, we need to have an idea of what libertarianism is. So oftentimes in American and Western conversation, the idea of libertarianism is a little confused. We often associate it with right-wing ideologies and kind of separatist movements from the mainstream. And while that has its place, libertarianism broadly is about skepticism of the role of the state. It's based in a lot of ways on the thinking of John Locke, who was an Enlightenment thinker who influenced men like Rousseau. He has a phrase that you probably have heard of called a blank slate. That's where you kind of learn and you are written upon by the society around you. You learn your values. You are open to learning basically anything when you were born. But John Locke also talks about something called tacit agreement. And that is that you buy into the social order tacitly by choosing not to leave. Libertarians often dispute this, saying that you have the option to leave and perhaps ought to choose it. There are two main divergences in libertarianism, one being anarcho-communism and anarcho-capitalism. Think of this as the far right and the far left. And what they're both essentially saying at their core is that to achieve the goals that we want, we don't need the government to do it, people can do it from them for themselves. Be that by living peacefully together in a communal state or by having a capitalist society where kind of the free market dictates all. 
So today we're probably going to wind up referencing the far right mostly. Uh, this is in large part because that is the society that is informed by Highland's works. It is the place where you most often see citations of the moon as a harsh mistress. And if you talk to men like Ben Shapiro, they're often going to tell you that Robert Heinlein was a major influence on them. Right-leaning libertarian thought tends to see the role of the state in two ways. First and foremost, the state's responsible for the military, i.e. maintaining borders and maintaining military security from external threats. They also tend to see the state as having a secondary role, and arguably the more important role, which is that the state should help people protect their property rights. In a lot of ways, libertarianism sees property rights as the fundamental basis that society builds itself upon. That is, if I don't have the rights to myself and to the things that I own, there is no way to have a society that is reliable, that is ordered, that has any kind of regularity. Libertarianism in a lot of ways is kind of the American belief. There's this sense of individualism, but also of small scale community. That is that it is the family structure church structures, local structures that are fundamentally going to be the place where you find solutions that don't also infringe on people's rights. Notice that for a lot of these institutions, the buy-in or the membership is an active one. You choose to be a part of your family. You can choose to move away. You choose to be a part of your church. You choose to be a part of the community where you live. It is not passive. There is no tacit agreement. And libertarians are in a sense, kind of optimists. They think that society is self-regulating, that you don't need an overarching structure to enforce things like moral or social norms, and that by doing so, you create a more reliable, self-sustaining community. And so here's kind of, I think, where some of the confusion about Heinlein comes in, and admittedly, I think it's probably the source of some of my own mixed feelings which is that libertarianism itself doesn't take on any social policies. In that regard, the state should let individuals have complete freedom over how they choose to live their lives. That means that it's not taking on any kind of vice laws. There is no state-sanctioned marriage in libertarianism. There's no welfare state, but there's also nothing like vice laws or anti-homosexuality laws. There's simply the right for the individual to choose. And you'll see throughout reading the book that it provides a, a libertarian ideal of a society wherein corporations have power, but so do kind of the average person. You can choose not to deal with the power that be. And perhaps most at play in The Moon is a Harsh Mistress is Heinlein's firm belief that communities and individuals can regulate themselves. That is something you see time and time again from the way that he has the community deal with internal struggles, like women being sexually harassed on the street, to how they manage with marriage, children, inheritance. It is the role of the individual and the community to deal with how they manage their members of society when they break from what would be considered acceptable behavior and how they deal with things like property rights. It is pretty radical in that regard. If you're really interested about learning more about libertarianism, I have a couple of resources I'm going to point you to. Those will be listed in the description bar down below, but primarily I want to point you to a couple of nonfiction items and then a couple of fiction ones. Before we move on and we talk about libertarianism and the moon is a harsh mistress kind of together, I want to give you a couple of resources. First and foremost, I want to give you some nonfiction upon which libertarian thought is based. I think there are two very important places to look for this. The first of which is Robert Nozick's Anarchy, the State, and Utopia. This is kind of a fundamental oft-cited work for libertarians, and it goes over a lot of fundamentals of libertarian thought, especially the role between the state and the individual. The second is a work by John Rawls, who's actually kind of, in his own way, Robert Nozick's academic nemesis. The second work is called A Theory of Justice, and it goes over the idea that, like, there are certain things about us that we just can't get past as far as equality and as far as the role of the state and the individual. And those are things that we need to look at. Now, Robert Nozick and John Rawls are kind of always pitted against one another, and it is, yes, philosophical. Um, 
but also a little personal. The two of them had offices down the hall from one another at Harvard and would often go to lunch together to basically argue. They were friends and I think that, that is kind of an important context to take with this is that even when libertarians and not libertarians have had these really deep, very controversial kind of conversations with one another, the, the, the consensus is to enjoy the company of one another regardless, which I should hope we would all take all political conversations with. And then I really want to mention to you some fiction works that I think you will enjoy. I have three fiction works that I want to talk about. The first is one that I think informs libertarian thought broadly, and that is Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. And that's a work that is pretty controversial, um, but I think it's to the heart of individualism and the idea of self-sufficiency. It is also used really as a touch point for a lot of the current conversation about libertarianism and about self-sufficient living. It has a lot to do with anarcho-capitalism, even if it is maybe not the best representation of such, and I think is really important if you want that full context. The other two works are entirely fictional works that are within the modern day. Uh, the first is Luna New Moon by Ian MacDonald, which if you've been around my channel you know I love, and the other is The Light Brigade by Cameron Hurley. So Heinlein's work is put up into three parts, the first of which is called A Royal Dinkum Thinkum. And this is really the expedition of the story, right? It's, it's where we explore the very basics of the society he's giving us, it's where we get to meet our first characters, where the problem is really introduced. And so I think this is a really important part of the story insofar as it is where the conflict is really set up. From the beginning, Heinlein is basically signaling to us that this is going to be a story about libertarianism. So from the very beginning, Heinlein is setting up a system in which the, the average person can't win. Rather than having a society in which people can compete, the moon is owned by what's called the Luna Authority. And the Luna Authority is a sort of sub-branch of the United Nations that kind of has some capitalist interests, but also mostly just wants to maintain power. It's a, it's really a bureaucratic organization that has kind of grown into something other than what we would traditionally think of as a bureaucratic organization. And Luna itself is a place that used to be a penal colony. So people who were otherwise disruptive or criminals or somehow subversive were sent to Luna with the idea of getting them out of your hair. As a result, that in combination with there not really being investment of having bureaucratic peoples on the ground for the Luna Authority has created a very self-sufficient system in which there are really no laws, there are no regulations, people just monitor themselves under the kind of guise of this overarching authority that sometimes decides to kind of smack people around and sometimes decides to leave them be. One of the really key important points is that the society is economically isolated. The moon is a place where people can't often reach to trade goods and they can't really negotiate freely for themselves with Earth. And that is really important as the story goes. And that will be a really important theme to keep in mind, not just within libertarianism, but within the moon as a harsh mistress. Manny himself serves as a kind of libertarian ideal. He is the product of generations who have bought themselves out of kind of imprisonment. His great-great-grandfather, or whatever it is, has, has been imported as a criminal. His grandmother was brought in as a kind of political subversive figure. And they bought their way out, creating essentially a freedom for themselves and their family. Manny lives in a line marriage, which is essentially a not quite polyamorous marriage. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but polyamory is probably the best shorthand for it. And they live in their own isolated corner of Luna. They provide their own energy, water, food. And so he's not really touched in a lot of ways by the political struggle that is the Luna Authority as a whole. His family is philosophically in conflict with the Luna Authority and that they don't believe in being controlled or managed and they intentionally seek ways to make their family independent of the authority. And on top of that, there's a real pride that Manny and his family have in being born free. That is, free of the kind of indentured servitude that has been the relationship between the Luna Authority and the criminals who have been kind of imported into Luna. 
Manny's family's belief in self-sufficiency and they are extracting themselves from Luna kind of as an economic whole creates a sort of true believer situation wherein Manny is the ideal representative of somebody who would be a libertarian. He doesn't believe in engaging unnecessarily with the state. He doesn't actively pursue any kind of political drama. He just believes in fulfilling his role with his family and making sure that they are taken care of. They take care of their own social and kind of situational issues. And that's a big theme on Luna to begin with. Manny has a lot kind of to leverage against the system. He works as a contractor. He's one of the few people with specialized knowledge to deal with the computers. And that's how he meets Mike. Mike is the computer hardware system slash creature inside the computer. And Mike is a sort of om omnipotent human who lives in the, in the computer. He's not actually human. He doesn't know a lot about human interaction, but he sees everything, knows everything, and of course loves Manny to no end. And so through Mike, Manny has a lot of means, one, to gain power, and two, to explore the fundamental questions of libertarianism. Highland does not let either of these go to waste. Part one ends with Manny essentially being thrust into the heart of an uprising. A neighboring group of upstarts is, comes to his particular city and causes an actual riot. Manny gets caught up with a woman named Wyo. Wyo is sort of supposed to be presented as a libertarian goddess. <laughs> um, she, is, she is espousing that people should get together and fight the man. Part two builds upon the first part because Manny is bringing Wyo into the heart of his self-sufficient identity. He brings her home, he helps her integrate into society at the Luna Authority, or Luna City I should say, and introduces her to Mike. As a kind of trio, they begin forming an uprising in which they later bring into a professor who's like a political theory expert. And they kind of come up with this plot. There is violence and sex and uprising and everything you probably would want in a story. I should mention that there are some problems within the story because Wyo kind of becomes a figurehead for asking every dumb question ever. And the women of the story solve a lot of problems by jumping half naked in front of guards who then no longer pay attention so they can shoot them. It's a thing. <laughs> but at its heart, the second part builds towards a climax, which is that the professor and Manny are going to go down to Earth to speak with essentially the United Nations about how Luna wants its freedom and how they are ready and willing to fight for it. Part three, of course, is called Tinstoffel, or There is No Such Thing as a Free Lunch. Um, some variations of it, for those who are grammatically less correct, are Tinstiffel, or There Ain't No Such Thing as a Free Lunch. Um, and <laughs> this is, of course, where the actual battles happen, where they win the Luna Authority, and where the, the idea of a self-sufficient government that takes care of itself, where people are responsible for their own actions takes place. And there are a couple of things that I, I think are really important to pay attention to if you're reading this with an eye towards libertarianism, not the least of which is the way that kind of the doctor and Manny talk to one another. Keep in mind, of course, that they are, they are, they are poked along by dumb questions Wyo asks. Highland is very intentional about setting up a world in which bureaucracies don't listen to the average person. So much so that the people on Luna don't actually have a court system at all, right? This is the pinnacle of a distant bureaucracy, one that is not invested in the care of its, of its citizens even remotely. People on, on Luna uh, are required to kind of find their own judges and those people will kind of, as you pay them, evaluate customs and fairness. There's a really important scene, I think, in the first about half of the of the book in which uh, Manny, <laughs> Manny judges what would be a murderous offense uh, because the, a bunch of like strangers find him on the street and pay him. So there's a there's a lot of ways in which he's attempting to point at self-sufficiency, point at 
kind of a society that takes care of its own without the need for any kind of government. And I think those are really important moments. There are a number of them scattered throughout the books. Interestingly enough, if you read Luna New Moon, uh, there is also a tactic that uh, McDonald explores. In short, if you read this book, you're going to see a number of key libertarian ideals pointed at. Self-sufficiency, the, uh, the need to opt into a system in order to make it legitimate, uh, the idea that bureaucracy is not necessarily inherently interested in the well-being of its citizens, and the idea that a society ruled by the interests of its own, essentially, economic producers, right? Those people who create value like a John Galt, side note, actually referenced in the book, is, is going to be better run or more efficiently run. Uh, there are a number of criticisms of this, which we won't get into today, but I think those are really important key takeaways and things to look at when you are reading this book. So there you have it. That's a brief overview of The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. It is far from a comprehensive look into the role of libertarianism and Robert Heinlein's influence of. It is basically just a brief primer. If you have things you'd like to add, I would love to hear that in the comments down below. This is a series on political theory in political science and science fiction. And we're going to be doing a number of these uh, kind of in-depth looks throughout the, the year. The next book we're going to be looking at is Infomocracy by Malka Older. Uh, that's always a hard one for me to say. I think it's the two L's. And this looks at the role of information and especially the role of data privacy in the kind of modern technological era and how that plays into the meritocratic system that we purport to have in America. I'm really, really excited for this one. Again, leave me your thoughts down below. Go ahead and share this video. If you wanna go ahead and support this channel, you can go on over to my Patreon page and you can get early access to videos, help me pick books to read and things like that. You can also go ahead and support us for free by sharing this video or following me over on Twitter and Instagram. I hope you're having a fantastic reading week. I'll talk to you later. Bye.